And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's <laughs> blood? <laughs> Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can I?
and to my having had so very little anxious care or worry all my life. I've told our Methodist preachers, never attempt to do more in one day than you can accomplish with peace of heart and mind. It was good advice then, and it's good advice now. My story. Before I was born, my father, the Reverend Samuel Wesley, was having evening prayers with my mother, Susanna, in which at what, <laughs> my father noticed that my mother, Susanna, had failed to say amen to his prayer for King William III of England. You see, my mother believed that the recently deposed Stuart kings, who just happened to be Roman Catholic, were the rightful heirs to the throne of England. My father believed that the monarchs William and Mary, who had just been installed by Parliament, were the rightful heirs to the throne of England. And so my father announced to my mother, Susanna, if we have two kings, we must have two beds. My father left the parsonage the next afternoon, announcing to Susanna, until you can be loyal to the throne of England, I'll have nothing more to do with you. returned the next summer for a short visit. He was not intending to stay as long as he did, but one of the, one of the servants set fire to the rectory, the parsonage. And so my father stayed on just a bit longer than he intended, and how do I put it? Out of that reconciliation, I, John Benjamin Wesley, was born June 28, 1703. One of 19 children born to the Reverend Samuel and Susanna Wesley, although only nine of us survived infancy. I think I, I think I see one or two of you surprised at number 19. Don't be so surprised at number 19. My mother herself is the last of 25 in her family. Mm. There's another fire about which you might be a bit more familiar. It happened at the age of five. I can still smell that damp smoke in my nostrils. The children, we, the children, myself, our brother Charles, Younger daughter, Hetty, plus the nanny, we were asleep up in the upper bedroom, second floor of the house. Fire broke out, commotion, screaming, hollering people, just running everywhere. And so the nanny got Charles up, got Hetty up, and everybody's going down the stairs. And, and no one checked on me. They assumed I was coming, but I didn't. I slipped right through it. Family got down in the courtyard, started counting heads. You remember that took a while? And uh, my father had eight children at the time. And suddenly my mother looked around. She said, where's Jackie? Where's, where's Jackie? Anybody seen Jackie? And they looked up, and there I was, peering out the window of the second story, like this, just thinking, somebody help me. So my father, he grabbed his coat, and he went running up the stairs, like this, and he used his coat as a shield, trying to get to me. And the flames battled him back. You can imagine, you can imagine what my father was going through. So he put the coat on again, and used his shield going up. Battled back again. going to get him down. One man hollered, somebody go get a ladder. Another man said, there's not time to get a ladder. Here, get on my shoulders. And so one man stood and they made a human ladder. He got down there on his shoulders and reached up and reached up to the second story and he just, he just, he just reached me just like that. And I jumped into his arms and he lowered me to the ground and as soon as I arrived at the ground, the second story came in. My father knelt in the courtyard in front of our house and he prayed this prayer. He said, Lord, Lord, let my, let my goods go. Let my papers, my books, the house, everything. I've got my eight children. Lord, it's enough. My mother sat me down. It was a bit after the confusion. We children got farmed out to various houses and families to care for us while they rebuilt and figured out what we were going to do. During this time, my mother sat me down and she said, Jack, <laughs> God has spared you for a purpose. And you and I together are going to find out what that purpose is. God has, God has a destiny for you, Jack. You're, you're like a stick. I'm hearing the prophet Amos and Zechariah. You're like a stick that's been dragged from the fire. You're like a brand that's been plucked from the fire. Jackie, God has his hand on you for a reason. You have been miraculously saved. 
And you and I together will find out what that purpose is. Part of that purpose was for me to go to the Charterhouse School for Boys in London at the age of 11. My mother had given all of us children a basic education, you know, reading, writing, maths, but uh, she wanted us to have a higher education, and so I was, I was off to Charterhouse School in London. And while I was there, I started refining what I believe. Listen carefully. This may be you as well. I started refining what I believe it meant to be right in God's eyes. You ready? It was a life of spiritual disciplines wrapped around by self-denial. That is, if I could be faithful to read my Bible, say my prayers, give to the poor, especially if I could make sure that none, none, none of the pleasures of the world that started coming in on my flesh, I would accept that I would get rid of anything that would please my flesh, anything, that I'd be pleasing in God's sight. That would be the basis of the right relationship. I believe the same thing when I went off to Oxford in 1720 to study for the ministry. I was ordained, and by the way, studied at the Oxford at Christ Church, the most prestigious college in Christ Church, called, uh, the most prestigious college in Oxford called Christ Church. While there, my brother Charles and I were involved in something he started and I helped and we kept it going called the Holy Club. Now, it was called the Holy Club not because we thought we were more holy or better than anyone else. It was because we, again, we decided we would set, a, set accountability before ourselves to be holy in God's sight with the reading, with prayers, with giving, with just, just avoiding any, anything that would please our flesh. This is what would make us right, right in God's eyes. And that's what we desired. We wanted to be right in God's eyes. And it was through this activity that we could do that. And we believe that 10 years later, after we've been ordained, 10 years later, we decided to be part of a group that would take the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, to the new world, to the American colony, specifically to the colony of Georgia, where I would be a, I'd be a preacher, a minister to the American Indians, and Charles, my brother, would be a chaplain to Colonel Logelthorpe, the governor of this colony. How can I best describe what happened in Georgia? Do you like surprises? This missionary adventure was full of them. The first one was on the ship going over. We encountered a horrible storm. I mean, this ship was rocking, it was reeling, the wind was ripping the mainsail in pieces, water coming over the side. I remember saying, look, this is it. This is the end. We're not going to make it. And while that was going on, over in the corner of the deck, there was a group of German Christians called Moravians. And they were holding a worship service. They were praising and they were praying. And I'd never seen anything like it. And when it was over, I went up to their leader and I said, Was you not afraid? No, I wasn't afraid to die. What about your women and children? Weren't they afraid? No, women and children ain't afraid to die either. Never heard of such in my life. Why, you let, you let death look me in the face and I'm troubled. You see, I have what's called a fair weather religion. I'm not equipped for death. What do these Moravians have that I don't have? Upon landing, we landed a little island called uh, Tybee Island, just off near Savannah, just off the coast of Georgia, there near St. Simons. And uh, surprised, we had a Creek Indian chief who came out and boarded the ship, walked on. His name was Chief Tomachachi. He had actually visited us in Britain. And uh, Chief Tomachachi greeted me with these words. Our people are hungry for this great word. Wonderful. But we would not be made Christians as the Spaniards make Christians. We would be taught before we are baptized. Well, I've never heard of anything like that. Okay, I agreed. Talk about continuing surprises. And these German Moravians again. German Moravian, Mr. Spangenberg, came up to me one day. He said, Wesley, do you have the witness within yourself? Does your spirit bear witness with the Holy Spirit that you're a child of God? I admit, I was so stunned. I didn't know what to answer. He continued. 
Wesley, do you know that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world? Well, I hope he's died to save me. Oh, true, he's died to save you. But do you know it? I do. But I feel there were vain words for in Georgia, as at Oxford, as at Charter House, I believe that right relationship with God was built on spiritual disciplines and self-denial. I did not have a heart relationship with God. The surprise has continued. A big surprise. Charles left after only five and a half months. Uncle Thorpe treated him terribly. Oh, oh, when he got sick, Uncle Thorpe made him sleep on the floor. He didn't respect Charles at all. And one day, Uncle Thorpe decided that he would send Charles back to England to put down the rumors that the Georgia colony was in a shambles. Charles was only too happy to blind. But I will say to you that Charles Wesley returned to England as one broken missionary. I stayed on and encountered the biggest surprise, the eventual surprise that led to my leaving America two years after Charles. It had to do with a certain young lady. You didn't realize it was going to come out of this sometime, didn't you? You see, her name was Sophie Hawkey. She was 19, I was 33. She asked me if I'd be her teacher, her tutor. I said, surely. And so we sort of liked each other, yes. In fact, it came to the point where I decided I was going to take two days and go into the woods and pray and, and seek God to see if we should enter into marriage. So I went to the woods to pray. I came out for two days, and I was convinced that God did not want me to marry somebody. I, I didn't want the distraction in ministry. But she came to me. And she said, John, I've been thinking. Mm, yes. I've been thinking about marriage. Mm, yes. And I have decided, with Mr. Wesley's permission, of course, I have decided to marry Mr. Williamson. Who? In two days. When? Once I put it more precisely. What? This Williamson was with a dull, irreligious fellow. Had no reason to be around me. I told Sophie, I said, Sophie, you marry Williamson, and in six weeks you'll lose almost all the grace you've ever had. She married Williamson, and in six weeks she lost almost all the grace she ever had. You, you probably hear a bit of, I told you so in there, don't you? Well, that was in April. In August, she came down to Holy Communion. I refused to serve her. Wait. You see, Sophie Hockey had failed to follow the laws of the church. She had failed to inform the curate, the associate minister of intention to commune, which was the law of the church. And she had failed to confess her sins openly, which was the law of the church. And so, I had no choice. I refused to serve her Holy Communion. Do you know what her uncle did? By the way, her uncle, the chief magistrate, he filed suit against him. He said, I was jealous. <laughs> jealous. Ha! This frivolous lawsuit dragged on from August to December. It was just such a distraction. It was wrecking my ministry, my life, my thought life. I had no peace. And on December the 22nd, I took what the American colonial press called Mr. Wesley's much hurried leave of America. And perhaps some would say, John Wesley, you were a fugitive of justice. I got on the ship. And as I was sailing back to England, I was plagued by what I'd seen from the Moravians. And I decided they had things in their heart and life that I didn't have, and we needed to, I needed to find out what the difference was. So I would do a comparison on the ship, the long ship ride. I'd do a comparison. I'd think about the Moravians. So I started writing it out all down. Are they studied in philosophy? So was I. In ancient and in modern tongues, is that the difference? Is that why they have peace with God and I don't have it? 
Is it their study of ancient and in modern tongues? No. I was versed, so was I. Are they versed in the science of divinity? I too had studied it many years. Can they talk fluently upon spiritual things? They can't be it. I do the very same. Are they plenteous in alms? Behold, I give all my goods to feed the poor. Do they give of their labor as well as of their substance? Why, I delivered my body up to be devoured by the deep parts with heat, consumed by toil or weariness or whatsoever God Almighty be pleased to bring upon me. Be it more or less, it matters not. But does anything I can ever do, give, say, or suffer, justify me in God's sight? By no means. I repeat, I went to convert the American Indian. Who would convert me? And I arrived back in England just as miserable as when I'd gone. That was February 1738. And I did the only thing I knew to do. And it sounds so strange to my ears to have to tell you this. I found Peter Bowler, confided in him, another friend. Guess what? Another Moravian. Bowler, I'm considering giving up the ministry. I hear Bowler's little gruff voice. Oh, Wesley, by no means neglect the gift that is within you. But, but Bowler, how can I preach faith if I have no faith myself? Oh, Wesley, you preach faith until you have it, and then because you have it, you will preach it. I thought that was the most daft advice I'd ever received. But I grabbed my mate Charles Kishon, and we went out to preach faith. And it became soon and readily apparent to all of our audiences that we had none of that of which we spoke. But the good part was, the more I preached about faith, the more I know I needed it in my life. God was planting seeds in my heart. And I was not at peace, but I would continue to seek. And it continued until May of 1738. And if you're a Methodist tonight, remember that month, May 1738. That's when it all changed. On the 21st of May, I received word that my brother Charles had been gloriously converted to Christ. We rushed over his house and we sang hymns and, and said prayers and just worshipped the Lord together to thank God for being so kind and merciful to such a one as Charles. But even as we did, I was longing in my heart to experience the same thing Charles did on May the 21st, 1738. And then it happened. Three days later, those of you who call yourselves Methodists, you can trace Mr. Wesley's experience back to that day when the Methodists took a turn. I rose at my normal 4 a.m. that morning. The Bible fell open to 2 Peter chapter 1. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. As I was rushing out the door, my Bible fell over to St. Mark, chapter 12, verse 34. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. That evening, I went to even song at St. Paul's Cathedral in central London. The words of the hymn, that even song, penetrated my heart. O Lord, out of the depths have I cried unto thee. O Lord, if thou wouldst keep a record of our wrongs, who may stand? O trust in the Lord. O trust in the Lord. That night, I went rather reluctantly to one of our Methodist society meetings. Methodist society, we were still part of the Church of England, the established church. But a Methodist society where we gathered to worship and to teach and to pray for one another. And I went to one of our society meetings which was being held in, in London on Aldersgate Street. And I arrived late, about a quarter to nine, and I sat in the rear of the building, just came on in, and there was a man up front who was reading, giving the lesson from Martin Luther's commentary 
on the epistle of St. Paul the Apostle, Luther, two centuries before. And he was reading from the preface. You know the preface? The part of the book you always sort of want to skip over? He was reading from the preface. And these were the words that I heard him say. Faith is a divine work in us which changes us and makes us newly born of God and kills the old Adam and brings with it the Holy Spirit. Oh, faith is a lively, creative, active, powerful thing. He said before, if anyone asks if good works are to be done, faith is already done them and is always acting. And before I had a chance to ask my usual theological question about how this change occurs in the heart, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ. Christ alone for salvation. And assurance was given to me that Christ had died for me, for my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. As I was walking home that night, that old tempter Satan came to me. And in times past, when he came to me, I'd be, I'd be afraid, I'd be frightened. But tonight, I was not conquered, I was the conqueror. Old tempter Satan came to me and he said, Oh, this can't be faith, where's the joy? My response Enemy, beware! Enemy, beware! Oh, God, give me 13 men in England with such a faith in him as I, and we'll give England back to God. Oh, God, give me, give me a hundred preachers. I cannot one straw whether they be clergymen or laymen, but men who, who fear nothing but sin and who, who desire nothing but God. Such shall shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. I got to my house, went to bed, slept beautifully. Woke up the next morning. First thing, that old tempter Satan came to me. Before I even got out of bed, my response Jesus, Master. And so began what came to be called the 18th century evangelical revival. A revival marked by changed lives. What was the main vehicle that God used to bring about this revival? Well, one of the mains, not the mains, preaching. It was calculated that I preached more than 800 times a year for more than 50 years. Now that's 40,000 sermons. And to preach these 40,000 sermons, I rode on horseback somewhere between, perhaps some of a lot more time on hand and shoot, I had the calendar all over, between 225,000 and 250,000 miles on horseback. So that's why I sort of naturally walk like this these days, and I've had to train myself to walk differently. We had our we had our main preaching station there in London. It was a, a triangle preaching station. It's out of certain South London and South England and London. Went over to the coast to Bristol and way up to the north in Newcastle. It was a triangle. It was a triangle of 600 miles. I rode that triangle 70 times. I went to, went to Ireland 21 times. Now, I didn't ride my horse to Ireland. In a bit of water between, yeah, you know. Anyway, I rode my horse to the coast, and then I get a ship, and I ride in Ireland, and then I find another horse and ride around the ministry. Uh, oh, by the way, did I mention? I don't think I did. Jolly old England, it rained once or twice. <laughs> Later in my ministry, um, a carriage has been provided for me. There's a writing desk, there's a shelf for my books. 
It's, it's quite, quite terrific. Uh, on, on horseback, you know, I, I read and write and sleep. But the carriage was really nice. And we're still doing it. Just the other day, just the other week, I guess it was, I, I preached three times on a Sunday. And between sermons, three different places, I rode on horseback 76 miles. That's the task that God placed in my hands. Now, I don't think these 40,000 sermons were all sort of individual sermons. But, you know, get up, a, get up a new sermon for the new crowd and so on. No, in the middle of the, this century, I decided we'd have so 44 standard sermons. Why? The Methodist movement was marked by lay preachers. And I gave them material that they could use. And our ordained ministers as well from the established Church of Church of England were joining us in the Methodist movement. But Methodism has been marked by lay preachers. 44. A lot of them were brief and to the point. All right. A few of them I could go on just a bit. 44 standard sermons. And I preached them. I go to one place. I preached the same one there, but I preached here. By the way, there was a, there was an old wag who followed me around the country. He countryside. He came up to me one day and said, Mr. West, I've been following you, you know. Um, from place to place. That's the tenth time in a row I've heard you preach the same sermon. <laughs> and in the heat of conversational battle, I couldn't think of anything to say other than, um, yeah, uh, yes, it's because you haven't got it yet. <laughs> he had that one coming. That's enough on frequency. What about location? Well, how should I say it? The churches became closed to us. There were a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is they considered us to be heretics. Because I was not exactly following what they thought was the script of the established church. And the churches became closed to us. Another is they saw that all the things were happening wherever we went and preached. And they didn't want that kind of commotion. Did I mention enthusiasm? They didn't want that kind of enthusiasm in their church. But I will confess to you, before I got converted, I thought it was a sin if someone got converted outside of the church. But my colleague, not often always the closest colleague, but a colleague in the ministry who were closer at times than others, George Whitfield. Whitfield convinced me that it was all right to preach in the fields. And we decided, we Methodists decided to take the church to the people. And we preached to the farmers and the gardeners and the coal miners. And I will say to you that I am amazed at those who speak of the indecency of field preaching. My friends, the greatest indecency is found in St. Paul's Cathedral in central London where people are talking and, and sleeping and uh, looking all about not minding a word the preacher says. No, my friends, the greatest decency is to be found in the fields where people look and listen as if God himself were speaking to them. Let me give you an example. Then a man in charge says, oh, no, Mr. Wesley, you can't preach here. Not allowed. I said, this is my father's former parish. I'm going to be preaching this evening. No, you're not, Mr. Wesley. It's not allowed. But this, we are quite aware it's your father's former parish, Mr. Wesley. You are not allowed. Hmm. So, I walked out the back door of that church into the cemetery. And I, oh, there it is. Found my father's tombstone. And I stood atop his tombstone and I preached. Churches were closed to us. Why would you say again that happened? What about the content? What was it in this content that was stirring the up so badly? Well, in these 44 sermons, we had some that they really responded quite negatively to. They just, I don't know, they just weren't ready for it. One was entitled, The Almost Christian, out of Acts chapter 26, St. Paul and Herod Agrippa. And Agrippa entered, uh, entered, uttered those memorable words. Paul, thou almost persuadest me to be a Christian. And my challenge to the audience was, friends, my fear is, is that many of you who are half awake will be wide awake on Judgment Day. Didn't like that very much. 
Another one I preached, uh, pretty common, was called On Riches. You see, there's a teaching in England that if you were blessed with riches, material goods, oh my goodness, God was blessing you. He, you were in right relationship with Him. On Riches. And I, I love to tell the story of the, the Grand Marquis that I came around, I turned across. He, he was worth, he just died recently, he was worth 40,000 pounds sterling when he died. Now, how much is that? Well, we thought Methodist preachers were pretty well paid at 150 pounds sterling a year. Grand Marquis died and left 40,000 pounds. Do you know how much money he had when he died? What he did with it? He left it all behind. You know what he's got now? Six feet of earth. That didn't sit very well. In fact, it was preaching this sermon in the village of Winsbury that I came as close as I ever have to losing my life. They grabbed me by my hair and dragged me through the city town square. And I remember as I was being dragged, telling myself, this is the end. This is the end. But God in His mercy spared me. You see, friends, it seems to be, maybe you'll agree with this, wherever we went, we had revival or a riot. It led to some really great, monstrous confrontations, sermons like these. One happened in a, a village of Bath near Bristol. And I was warned not to go to Bath. Mr. Wesley, don't go to Bath. There's a, there's a gentleman in Bath, and he's going to challenge you, and it's going it's to get very nasty. And you don't want to go to Bath. I said, no, I, I am used to it. It's not a problem. No, Mr. Wesley, we can't, we can't allow you to go there and preach because uh, this, this character is not, not going to like it. It's, it's, Bad news ahead. I said, I'm going to Bath to preach. And so I arrived, and just as I got up to preach, here, here came that champion pushing his way through the crowd. He got right up in my face and he said, I demand to know, sir, on what authority you say these things. Well, by the authority of the Archbishop of Canterbury, who laid hands upon me and said, Take thou the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, highly illegal, highly illegal, contrary to the act of Parliament. Contrary to the act of parliament, the act of parliament concerns holding secretive, seditious meetings. We've done nothing secretive. It's all been out in the open. Oh, no, no, no. Highly illegal, highly illegal. And besides, you frighten people out of their wits. I said, sir, how do you judge me? Oh, sir, by common report. Is not your name Nash? My name is Nash. Well, Mr. Nash, I feel I have not enough to judge you by common report. You see, he didn't know that I knew that his name was Bo Nash, a rather frivolous gamester who'd been expelled from Oxford. What shall I say? Secretive activities? And that's when Mr. Bo Nash just exploded. Well, I want to know why all these people come here tonight. And before I had a chance to answer him, there was a little old lady in the front row stood up and she said, Mr. Wesley, let me handle him. <laughs> Mr. Bumash, you look out for your body. We look out for our souls. That's for the food of our souls that we come here this evening. To which Mr. Bumash replied not a word, turned on his heels and left. <laughs> yeah, three cheers for the little old lady. Hip, hip, hooray. Couldn't have worked out better by pleasant than myself. Another confrontation in this preaching on a sermon called Sanctification by Faith. I thought you might be interested in this story tonight. I'd gone to this church to preach and, and I noticed I, the churches were occasionally open to us. Don't get the idea they never were. Occasionally, and it also depended on where in the stage of the revival. It was open to church that particular evening. And um, I, had, I had just started the sermon. And I noticed that I got up and walked out. And that, yeah, that wasn't very unusual for me, was it? But a man got up and walked out, and I went on preaching the sermon. Service was eventually over. The sermon was entitled Sanctification by Faith. And the sermon was over, and I left the church, and I grabbed my hat and my coat, and I'm walking down the road, and this man comes running up to me, Mr. Wesley, Mr. Wesley, come quickly. John Hayden's having a terrible fit. Well, I'm right to go, so we ran over to Hayden's house, and I got to Hayden's house, and there was a, a woman identified as his wife who was standing in the doorway of the house. She had this big apron and she was trying to shield everyone, all the onlookers, from what was going on inside. And I, I looked around. She said, please, 
Everyone go home. There's nothing to see here. I didn't tell you that. Nothing to see here. Everyone go home. <laughs> so I was peering around and I looked. And he saw me. He was on the floor and he, and he pointed his finger and he said, I, you're the man. You're the man that preached that sermon tonight. And he started rolling around on the floor, which I won't demonstrate, rolling around on the floor and beating his chest and screaming at the devil. It was most extraordinary. So I said to his wife, I said, I said, man, what happened? Oh, Mr. Wesley, it was terrible. It was just horrible. Yes, yes, man, what happened? Please tell me. Please tell me what happened to Mr. Wesley. You know, he, he went to the service. Said, yes, I know what the sermon. What, what happened? Well, Mr. Wesley got home, and, and he, he, after he left church, he sat down and his evening meal, and he was sitting at the table reading, and he, he was reading your sermon. And he got to the end of the first page, and he just turned pale. And he still did this, rolling around on the floor, beating his chest. And I heard him say, Devil, I don't belong to you anymore. I belong to Jesus. And he started rolling. And Mr. Wesley just keeps rolling around and rolling around. And Mr. Wesley seriously used him to do something. Please do it. I said, all right, let's gather around Hayden, everyone. Come on. People of faith, let's come together. We laid hands on Hayden. We stood around Hayden. We sang hymns. We prayed for Hayden. Alternatively praising God and rebuking Satan. And sometime between the hours of 2 and 3 in the morning, John Hayden was miraculously released in his spirit and set free. And all of that from the use by the Holy Spirit of God of a printed sermon. Time fails me tonight, or I'll tell you about at length about the woman at Kingswood who was listening to one of our sermons and was released from demons. Or, or the lady who was standing listening to one of our sermons and, and she was suddenly healed from head to toe completely in her body. And when it happened, she was standing next to her personal physician. God used these printed sermons. And there was a cost involved too in this revival to make these sermons available. In, in 1756, I counted up, we spent 1,235 British pounds sterling for the purpose of printing and distribution. We distributed these books and tracts for you without a cost. To save costs, I've, always, I've never worn a wig. I've always cut my own hair to save the price of a barber. I've always worn neatly mended shirts. I always figured that a neatly mended shirt will last a lot longer, and it is proven to be true. I wrote to the tax assessor in London recently, and I told him I only had two things that were of assessable value. They were two silver spoons, and one was in London, and one was in Bristol. And I'd never own anything more as long as there were poor people in the streets begging for bread. In fact, the height of the revival. I told our Methodist preachers to give up the habit of afternoon tea and take the money you spend on tea and give it to the poor. And those who had nothing would at least have something. And those who had plenty would still have something. As I look back on my long life, I can tell you, I believe there'd be a lot less evil in this world if folk had enough to eat. And as I say that, I can't help but remember First time I went to London as a boy, I saw a 12 year old hung from the gallows for stealing a loaf of bread. I think we've reached a turning point in the revival now. I received news just the other day that my brother Charles died. I woke up my usual four o'clock and I was preparing a sermon for five. From Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Seeing we are encompassed about by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And little did I know that that very hour, my brother Charles was among that great cloud of witnesses. My brother, Charles Wesley, was the, the great organizer. 
precursor of this revival movement. He was a great preacher in his own right. I've often said, preaching was the least of Charles Wesley's gifts. We fought like brothers too. We fought over love. Charles and I made an agreement. Neither of us would get married without the other's permission. I had intended to marry a, a young woman whose young widow woman whose husband had, had died at sea. <clears throat> Charles rode to her village and told her no. He wouldn't let his brother John marry her. I had no objection when he married Sally. He really spoke to me when I decided that I would marry Molly Versailles. One day I had been walking across London Bridge and I slipped and fell and a terrible sore on my leg and this lady came along she was a nurse and she, she bandaged me up and what can I say I fell in love with my nurse I decided to marry her but she she became quite incensed at the notoriety that I was receiving my travels took me far from home and I famously decided and proclaimed I, as a married man I would preach not one less sermon she even stirred up my opponents against me. And I think it's probably fair to say that I was married to a cause long before I was married to a wife. Charles was right. I married in haste. I repented at my leisure. We were actually never, never divorced. We just lived a life of separation. Charles also took the task over the commissioning of Thomas Coke and Francis Asbury and a few other men in the spread of the gospel in the New World, the Americas. Uh, I call Asbury and Coke, I, I designated them as superintendents. You see, when the Americans declared independence and began fighting, I was actually sympathetic to their cause. I understood why they were doing that, I supported it. But after I surveyed the carnage of war, I said I could support neither side. But when the war really heated up and persecution began against the Church of England ministers who were in the New World and those ministers fled to Canada and they went to Germany and they went back to England, I reached a very difficult decision point. How are the people left behind going to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion if all the ministers had left? You can see that, can't you? So I commissioned Coke and Asbury to take this gospel and go and serve communion to the people. Well, I did not know, and I was quite mad about it, angry, I did not know that Coke would call himself Bishop. Charles picked up on that, and uh, we really had a heated argument on that one because Charles believed that if, if Coke had been commissioned as a bishop, someone had commissioned him, and that person must have been a bishop. And so Charles pinned a little ditty about it. So easily are bishops made by man's or woman's whim. Wesley is hands on Coke hath laid. Who laid hands on him? The revival continued despite these ups and downs, and I will tell you tonight that there have been many results in which we can praise God. We Methodists established orphanages and schools, and the first free medical clinic in London, one of the geniuses of Methodist contribution to Christendom, has been what you call the small group. A group of like-minded people who came about weekly, regularly, and the main question was asked, are you ready? How is your soul? Have you been faithful in reading scriptures? Have you been faithful in prayer? Have you been faithful in giving alms? Is there anything in your life that, that you're, you're wondering if it's a sin or not? You're not sure about it. You tell it out. We'll discuss it. We'll help you with it. That was a Methodist, major Methodist contribution. These small groups of accountability. Oh, Lord, I pray they never go away. Probably the, the greatest contribution we made 
was in England avoiding a bloody revolution unlike our neighbors the French. We didn't have revolution. We had reconciliation. England was changed morally from top to bottom. It would take me from, mid, from now to midnight to tell you how that happened and all the results of that. Maybe you've got a little bit of an idea from the stories I've told you. England was changed from top to bottom. And it happened not by speaking to the political situation. It happened by speaking to the hearts of men and women. And there's been another result of the survival that you need to hear. We have spoken out in no uncertain terms and as strongly as we can about the most hideous crime under the sun, the most hideous evil of the British Empire, slavery. There was a young man converted to our ministry named William Wilberforce. And I told Wilberforce, and I have told him, Wilberforce, you speak up in Parliament and you continue to speak until this hideous crime is taken away. It's not acceptable in God's sight. We Methodists have led the way in that. We will continue to do so. And you know, I need, I, in fact, I need to go see Wilberforce and I need to remind him that he needs to carry on because I don't know if he's done it in a while. So I'm going to go, oh, before I go find Wilberforce. Um, I almost thought the main reason, one of the main reasons I came to see you tonight is I've wondered What's the future of Methodism? What's the future of this revival? Only God knows. But I tell you, He's looking for those who will participate in this ministry of reconciliation. Before you can participate in that ministry of reconciliation, you yourself have to be reconciled to God. Here's the evangelist coming out. I, I can't help it. I make no apologies for it. <laughs> You have to be reconciled to God. This is simply, it comes and happens as simply saying, God Almighty, I submit myself to you for this recreating of my spirit as I put myself into your hands. Friends, you seek him and you'll find him. He's waiting on you. He waited on me. He won't give up on you. Thank God he didn't give up on me. Do you know he's, he's never actually given up on anyone? And I doubt very seriously. You'll be the first. That's the end of my story. Perhaps it's only the beginning of Methodism. The beginning of your story. As I go, I reckon I should probably close tonight as I often close my salutations and my letters. I remain sincerely yours. Your brother, John Wesley.